Okay, I think we can get started on this last session. Uh, welcome back, everyone. And our first speaker is Dr. Quek, uh, Prof. Quek Yong Chuan. He's a PI at the Center for Content Technologies at NUS and Deputy Director of the Institute of Advanced Studies in, at NTU. And his permanent job is at NIE, so he's everywhere. Uh, he is the immediate past president of the Institute of Physics and a council member of the Association of Asia Pacific Physical Societies. He's also an elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the Institute of Physics UK. So, quick. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I don't expect you to stay so late. It's time to go home. But in any case, uh, it doesn't do justice to KK, whom I have a love-hate relationship sometimes. Uh, partly because uh, I was his deputy director for many years, and uh, it was very easy for KK to say, let's organize this, let's organize that. But then when it comes to organization, there's only one person, and the whole thing falls on my shoulder, and I don't like it. Now, uh, KK has two very well-known students, uh, Chan Hin and uh, uh, Hui Boon. And Hui Boon just passed away recently, uh, just in December, unfortunately. Otherwise, he would have been here. Uh, they all work on uh, phenomenology. Uh, so I'm not sure how many of you are into particle physics, but um, uh, uh, Chan Hin was into very much into hadron-hadron uh, collisions and uh, Fei Wen, uh, Hui Bun, he was on to Chaoyang statistics, uh, which you heard many times this morning. Uh, so this is a paper that talks about, uh, this is a paper that uh, KK does it with uh, Chiu Chongqi. Uh, 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 another member of the uh, Nanyang uh, who came over to NUS together with him. Uh, he also collaborated with S.Y. Low. S.Y. Low is interesting because he subsequently in, went into traditional Chinese medicine. <laughs> that were the two volumes that people are talking about. Uh, on my screen it looks funny, but over there I guess it's good. Uh, there was a banquet speech by Chen Ying Yang, uh, uh, and also they, that says that we shall hear tomorrow a speech from Masha, the official history of the Rochester Conference. But tonight, we, I will tell you unofficially some personal stories about the early Rochester Conference. Now, I became very much attached to the Rochester Conference, not because I was into particle physics, but because I subsequently handed uh, the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics, which transferred in 2014 uh, its secretariat to Singapore. And as you know, uh, uh, KK became the Secretary General, and uh, the Shadow Secretary General became uh, someone else. Uh, the International Conference of uh, Fundamental Sciences was organized at NUS, essentially, uh, in, in March 2000, and you can see that uh, uh, it was a, a, a watershed uh, sort of conference because uh, it brought uh, this person, one, two, three, four, five, the fifth person, who talks about quantum entanglement and secrecy to Singapore. And he subsequently sacrificed his next 20 years in Singapore to help us set, settle, um, to establish the quantum information science. Uh, by the way, I also, um, uh, I also remember very fondly uh, Kazuo Fujikawa, he's, he's still healthy and alive. So this is the guy who's smiling at you now, uh, Arthur Eckert. Now, uh, and for a long time, uh, there's, as you can see from uh, KK's slide earlier on, there's a whole long list of eminent scientists who benefited from uh, interactions with NTU, or maybe uh, not really benefited, but who came to Singapore uh, 
uh, and at least experience Singapore. Of course, there, there are people who still do not want to come to Singapore. Uh, uh, one of them being a few medalist, let's not mention his name, who, whom I tried to invite many times, but he said, uh, Singapore is a dictatorial country. I shall not go there. Um, so this is a whole list of uh, well-known people that are, that are replicates. So it looks long, but it's, it's not really that long. Uh, 2013, 2014, all the way until... And one of the remembering things that KK... Uh, well, at least this is what uh, the person up there, Christian Miniatura, who is uh, a tiny French person, because Miniatura means very tiny, uh, help to establish is to link us up with uh, Echo de Physics uh, de Rousse. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a well-known French school for graduate students, uh, help in the Alps, and uh, actually in, uh, near Grenoble. And, um, and it is well-known because uh, Gerard Sotov, uh, wrote in his Nobel Prize uh, a speech that he applied for Lesus and he was rejected. <laughs> so even Nobel Prize winners get rejected. That's the, uh, at that time, the French embassy ambassador and uh, also uh, our old principal, uh, president of NTU, uh, sitting up front. So uh, Lesus was started by C.C. Uh, the wit, um, and she actually came to Singapore uh, during her lifetime. I gave her a T-shirt uh, with uh, with uh, NTU uh, Lesus. Um, so this is the book that we published subsequently on ultra cold gases and quantum information. That was in 2009. Some of the people who attended that school eventually settled down in Singapore. Uh, actually not settled down, but visit Singapore on a permanent, semi-permanent basis. Uh, I'm talking about Gabriel. He's one of those. Now, NRF approached KK in 2011, or thereabouts, to conceptualize a significant global conference. They were impressed. We told them about Lindau Conference and the Gordon Conference. So Gordon Conference starts on Sunday and ends on Saturday. And... Uh, uh, we wanted to uh, essentially start something similar. But in the end, of course, we have uh, the GYSS, uh, the Global Young Scientist Summit, which is organized yearly except for the COVID period. The other uh, conference that the IAS is involved in, at NTU is involved in, is the International Science Youth Forum. And uh, that is held at Wachong, Universe, uh, Wachong uh, Institution. I nearly want to say Wachong University. Uh, the fifth International Science Youth Forum, so you have a spectrum of a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, actually, we cheated because uh, it was held around the same period as the GYSS. So we, uh, we, we actually get them for free uh, in that sense, but we don't let the Nobel laureates know. Uh, there were lots of memorandum of understanding uh, with that one was with uh, Société Française, I don't know, what's P? SFP, <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, KIAS, and also with the uh, AAPPS, which is the Association of Asia Pacific Physical Societies, of which I subsequently got involved in a lot. And this is a chart that you can actually see so uh, uh, this, mo this morning, this afternoon, this morning, uh, KK uh, showed you many, many events with words. Now I show you the many, many events on the chart. And you can see that there's an uh, exponentially growing trend, like all physics phenomena. Uh, uh, there are a lot of workshops, a lot of conferences, and we also organize schools. And eventually, you see this single white uh, blue dot uh, IUPAP. We brought IUPAP to Singapore. I'm not sure if people appreciate what is IUPAP. Who, what is IUPAP anyway? Uh, it is the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics. 
it is essentially uh, the United Nations for Physicists. So they become the, the voice for, uh, for, for physics people. In fact, uh, recently they just issued a statement against Putin. Uh, so it's a, a semi-political stuff. Uh, uh, KK is involved in a lot of uh, uh, activities. He was uh, as chairman of, uh, and vice chairman of NAFA, and therefore he was actively involved in Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts. He was involved in the Institute, Hua Chong Institute uh, Diploma Program, the NUS High School. So your, your, I know our, our friends here from NUS High School, you will be proud to say that KK was once your board of governors, and uh, also in Pioneer Junior College, and he left in 2010, but I took over from that job. I, I will relinquish next year. Uh, so, uh, and if you read Chinese, uh, you will see that uh, KK write a lot of articles to the Chinese press. Uh, he was from uh, uh, Nanyang University, and at that time, uh, uh, classes were sometimes conducted in Chinese. So uh, he is also actively involved in what's the Singapore China French Friendship Association. Uh, so this is one of those, uh, uh, um, and I think um, uh, he's at the end of the day still a businessman at heart. Uh, this is essentially a friendship association for business from China and business from Singapore. Um, he's Teochew, for those of you who don't know him, uh, in terms of dialect group, Singapore has uh, three major dialects, um, the Hokkien, the Teochew, and the Cantonese in the ratio of four is to two is to two. Uh, and he's Teochew. But the, the Teochew clan does not accept him into the, the uh, embrace him because uh, he betrayed them by being too actively involved in the Hokkien clan. <laughs> and uh, so he's actually involved in what's called the Tankaki Foundation. Uh, until recently, he was the chairman, uh, the th third chairman of the Tankaki. The second chairman was actually the uh, the son of uh, Tankaki, actually not quite the son, but yeah, adopted son. And he also established in 83 what's called the Tankaki Scholarship. Uh, There's a postgraduate scholarship. Now let me do some signs. Uh, you would have seen this appearing and you will shiver at this screen because uh, you, you need to restart your computer my computer, for my computer, this happened all the time uh, because I have a very old computer that is uh, cracking and this PowerPoint is produced from that cracking computer. A problem has been detected and then it says something to the effect that technical information at the bottom is those codes. And this actually is an error correction code. So error correction forms a founda ba fundamental basis, not so much for transmission nowadays, although it's still being used, but very much for, for checking if your network is working, if your uh, computer is working properly. So uh, it becomes uh, essential to a uh, part and parcel of classical computing, uh, even though you don't know it. And uh, sometimes this is called the blue screen of death. And in fact, it was uh, replaced, uh, common blue screen of death. You can sort it out. So computer memories in general needs uh, a lot of error correction. And uh, in fact, it, uh, one of the first to be implemented is what's called the Reed-Muller codes, uh, which are constructed from what's called Hamming codes. So Hamming codes, you, have, you can always find the Hamming distance by looking at the differences in the digits. But for satellite communication, of course, we have more sophisticated uh, 
uh, techniques of uh, transmission. We have phase shift key and uh, quadrature key. But uh, all these uh, are uh, not as good as the digital codes, uh, error correction codes that are mentioned here, like the Reed Solomon codes and, and so forth. So we inevitably need uh, error correction codes. Even when you go shopping and you have the supermarket, you scan it, you need that. And so um, uh, we, we next move rapidly to, uh, to uh, so-called quantum computer which I've been interested in for the last 20 years. Um, and uh, quantum computers uh, on the left is what the, the quantum computer looks like now. Uh, it's a little bit oldish, but uh, most of them needs a huge refrigerator. Um, the one on the right is not really a quantum computer, but uh, it is claimed that it can produce a calculation that are faster than a classical computer. Of course, you see from the diagram that it's got Chinese word in it, so it is uh, in China. And the lead PI of that group is uh, Tianwei, uh, whom I know very well. And uh, now he's more a politician than a scientist. Um, on the bench itself are just photonic circuits. Okay, and if you look at the one on the left, which is the superconducting qubit, uh, what is a superconducting qubit? At the end of the day, it is nothing more than a circuit, an electronic circuit. Uh, one of the simplest electronic circuit is an R, no, a LC circuit. If you put an inductor across a capacitor, you find that they resonate. And when they resonate, the, the flux that flows can talk to each other. You can imagine that. But uh, having an LC circuit is no good because if you quantize that, you reduce the temperature until it's at the coldest possible temperature, you find that it becomes a quantum harmonic oscillator. And the problem with quantum harmonic oscillator is that the energy levels are all equally spaced, which means that you can get from zero to one. And the moment you get to one, it can either go to one to two or two to three because it needs the same addressing. So you don't want that. So in other words, your zero to one is not isolated. Uh, so to pre prevent that, they replace the, they still retain the capacitor, but they replace the inductor with a Josephson junction. And the, the net effect of that is that you make the uh, harmonic oscillator no longer equally spaced. In fact, the first two levels are close together. The, the next level is actually far, far, pretty far away. So when you do activations or you address just the first two levels, you never address the third level. In principle, that should have been, but in practice, in the lab, it is harder. And the chip is very tiny. It's uh, probably the size of uh, uh, one and a half centimeter by one and a half centimeter, but the fridge is huge, okay? The chip is small, but the fridge is huge. So uh, IBM unveils the 400 qubit plus quantum processors. Now they retract and go, has gone recently gone back to 100 qubit again. But I think the effort in building a better and better quantum computer, there's a lot of hype in the IBM system, uh, will continue. And if you think about uh, uh, 40 years ago uh, with the computer industry, um, it is actually very primitive. Uh, 40 years ago, when was that? 1980s. We only have what's called the 286. You know how slow is the 286? 286 produce a Word document that produce garbage when you print it. So um, there, were, there were the problems. Those were the days. And before that, that was in the 80s already. And before that, in the 70s, you actually have basically huge computers uh, working with uh, very simple problems. So, at the moment, of course, what we have is noisy quantum computers. But perhaps, maybe, noisy quantum computers could be useful for chemistry problem because chemists always work at room temperature, and so we expect it to be harnessed. So, 
So that, oh, okay, let me skip that story. So I'm following, uh, so this is the NTU, NTU uh, uh, quantum computer uh, that's currently being built. It's part of CQT as well. Uh, uh, the, 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 the guy on the right has gone to Finland now. He's working with IQI. And you can see that as the number of iteration goes, the fractional uncertainty actually grows exponentially. So uh, it, it doesn't augur well for uh, a quantum computer, at least in the next five years. This is a cake that was given on the 60th birthday of uh, Jose Ignacio Latore, who is the current director of CQT. And uh, the cake is the fridge for the superconducting qubit, if you can see it. There are layers and layers of that. Now, so we actually, in order to do a noisy intermediate, uh, to overcome noisy in the intermediate quantum computer, uh, me, our group, and uh, a group from Toronto, we wrote a review article uh, which summarized our current status in some sense. And so we, what is uh, the, the goal? The ultimate goal is what so-called fault-tolerant quantum computer when the monkey has become a fully, uh, a morph into a fully beautiful lady, but at the moment, it is still the monkey stage. We are all at the monkey stage. We operate on single qubits, and the single qubits are terribly noisy. Now, this noisy intermediate scale quantum computer, or the ERA, was uh, actually uh, uh, coined by John Preskill, whom I invited many times to Singapore, but he never wanted to come. Uh, but it's not the one I was referring to earlier on, uh, who thinks Singapore is a dictatorial country. Uh, because he is not a field medalist. Now, most uh, uh, NIST computing now harness what's called the power of uh, quantum hybrid, uh, quantum classical arrangement. So you let the quantum computer do what they are best at. Uh, for uh, doing some unitary uh, operations. So some part of your algorithms can actually be performed with a quantum computer very efficiently. You let them do that. And then the optimization, which is typically very badly done by the quantum computer, you let a classical computer do it. Now the interface now becomes very important. How do you interface a quantum computer into a classical output? Now there is... Um, the first paper, in fact, on such an algorithm was actually produced by Jeremy's group. Jeremy is now uh, with PsyQuantum. Uh, he left because the UK couldn't give him a grant, but he then he became a boss of a company and he is now a millionaire. Uh, maybe that's better for him. It's always to force us to go to the industry. Uh, so variational quantum algorithm, uh, I'll skip this. So you heard you may have, or you may not know about it, but there are various algorithms. I'll just flesh it out. I'll not go into details because I don't have that privilege. Uh, QAOA is one, and uh, some of these algorithms you can find in the book that I wrote with uh, Professor Baki, uh, but uh, you can read it out on your own as well. Uh, we, in Singapore, we have also produced, uh, you saw the bench, that uh, Tianwei do on the, on the bench top. We try to duplicate it on a chip. So this is the chip that uh, beta version that we have created to handle boson sampling. Um, I'll skip that. Now what is the application of boson sampling? Well, we can presumably solve a lot of graph theory problem with it. So communication network, transport network, all this can be solved with this specific uh, single functional quantum computer quantum in inverted comma. Why? Because uh, it is, after all, a photonic computer. But while we are very far away from quantum, another uh, very important uh, breakthrough is on the horizon, and that is simulation. Uh, people have achieved a lot in recent years with uh, simulator by trapping uh, neutral atoms into optical lattice. And so when you do that, you let the neutral atoms hover around, 
you know the dynamics, the mathematics that describe how the neutral atoms hop around, and then uh, whatever you measure, that's the answer. How accurate is it? You don't know. But for a small system, you can calculate and you can verify. So this is called benchmarking. But the moment you get to a big system, you just have to trust the computer. Uh, but is it really? Will we really trust the computer? No, of course. We can test. There's always ways to test. And these tests are called benchmarking tests. So uh, uh, we have also explored some quantum simulations. I'll skip that. And in uh, the current noisy quantum computer, there are lots of challenges. And one of the challenge is what's called barren plateau, meaning that you do optimization problem, but the whole landscape is actually flat, which means you can never find the absolute minimum. The global minimum is what physics likes to find, but because it's flat, you just about never find it. So that is bad. That's one of the big problems. So barren plateaus are one big block. Uh, expressibility of answer. Now you need to put inputs into your quantum computer. But how do you prepare the inputs? How do you uh, uh, express your input? That is always a big deal. And how do you sample the output is always uh, a big problem. So there are, there, are, there, are, there are ways called error mitigation. So this is a paper by one of my former PhD students uh, who works with uh, Simon Benjamin in Oxford. Uh, and uh, essentially, it is how to reduce uh, sensitivity to noise and errors. I'll skip some of the detailed calculations. Uh, it was meant for more technical. So what are the applications? There are many. Uh, a lot of chemistry problems can be solved with uh, what's called variational eigensolver. And uh, uh, recently, we have uh, looked into the possibility to apply it to fermions. It's, fermion is a different word from bosons. Uh, so this is uh, a completely different uh, space. Uh, let me skip this. Uh, oh. must have done something bad or say something wrongly. Uh, okay, so let me uh, now briefly touch very quickly into photonic circuits, integrated photonic circuit, and now I'll end the day with that. Uh, how come it always flip? It's this slide, right? They don't like this slide. So these are uh, integrated photonic circuits. Uh, I, I took from uh, uh, a paper by Tian Wei, uh, Fabio, Anthony, and Mark. And uh, uh, it, it sort of uh, gives a rough idea. Uh, uh, Christian is seeing it the second time, so, so let me skip. So one of the ways is that you have a silicon chip, uh, silica on silicon uh, chip, and you just age. Uh, carve out waveguides. What are waveguides? Just lines where the, the light can pass through, essentially. And when you bring the two waveguides together, you essentially get a beam splitter. Okay, so what's a beam splitter? It splits the light, incoming light, into two different paths. Um, if you assemble enough of this beam splitter, you have what's called control knot gate. But unfortunately, this control not gate, because it's photons, and photons does not interact with each other. Uh, photons are very weakly interacting, almost not interacting at all. Um, um, it is probabilistic. Okay? It is no longer deterministic. So this is a, a bad thing. But if you uh, can live with probability, then it's fine. So you can build a lot of these gates. And so the idea is, uh, is that uh, you can uh, build a lot of such gates. But um, photons actually harness a polarization degree of freedom, uh, vertical and horizontal. And very often on the, on the bulk optics, you can easily manipulate photons and encode them in horizontal and vertical 
uh, degree of freedom. In other words, horizontal photons, uh, polarized photons are zero, vertical polarized photons are one. So, and then you can manipulate uh, all these gates. Except that on this uh, silicon chip, the beam splitter that you have, uh, say 50-50 beam splitter that you plan for the horizontally polarized photon doesn't work for the vertical. So when you change the polarization, that ratio changes. So what do you do? Well, the, the idea was uh, subsequently uh, proposed in, uh, in this, uh, uh, well, a, a few groups were doing it at the same time, so let me not antagonize all of them. Uh, but uh, they roughly uh, tilt the plane. So instead of uh, uh, producing uh, two waveguides coming together, you tilt this. And what happened is that when you tilt it, the, uh, the ratio for horizontal goes down, but the ratio for the vertical goes up. So there is a very nice spot where it becomes a 50-50 beam splitter, or any ratio for that matter. So that, that's how they do it. And they can do it because they use what's called laser writing. So what's laser writing? Laser writing means you have a piece of glass and then you put your laser through and it burns whole. It essentially burns a path. You see a lot of souvenir shops having laser written uh, chapels and things like that uh, for, as souvenirs. So uh, I'll skip those. So let me skip. So chips are, strictly speaking, like I mentioned before, very tiny. But the current quantum computer is that the fridge is huge, uh, and it only works at very low temperature, so you have to cycle it over the, uh, the, the, the helium and the, uh, the gas in order to reduce the temperature. Uh, the other very promising uh, uh, quantum computer is actually ion trap. So in ion traps, what you do is that you have an optical lattice and you trap uh, ions uh, in, the, in, in the pockets of the, uh, of the harmonic well. And what happened, of course, is that uh, uh, ion traps has advantage over superconducting qubit. It, it can control the, uh, the, uh, the ions, the, the gates, very much. Uh, better, in fact, with very good fidelity, almost 100%. However, it still needs very low temperature because without low temperature, what happens is that any quantum effects is lost. So the, our bet sometimes is still photonics, and photonics, because photonics were at room temperature, and it can be easily modularized. And this... Um, there are current scheme, they are all still working in the blue sky. I like to work in blue sky. When I first came into quantum computer, quantum computer never exist. Uh, uh, it must be my computer that produced such thing. And this is, uh, we recently applied for financial application, but it's really a toy model. Okay, um, we, we could show that uh, essentially we could show that uh, it performed Monte Carlo simulation. And what we do is that we, we push the light through the beam splitter, and naturally, with the, uh, by tuning the, uh, the ratio of the beam splitter, it, it performs up and down operations, very much uh, uh, simulating this Monte Carlo simulation. So we predict that maybe one day it can be proved to be useful, not for quantum purposes, but maybe for some classical purposes. Uh, that's the chip. The chip is really tiny. Eh? Uh, you can see that. Uh, I, I should put my finger there. Um, um, the other thing that we can do with this uh, uh, chip that we have uh, originally used, the first time we foray into this chip operation was to, do, to show that we can communicate using quantum key distribution, to establish quantum key distribution. But subsequently, we find that uh, it may also be useful for what's called optical computer. So an optical computing network uh, works very nicely. So we implement, in fact, a complex value network, uh, which some of the computer scientists were quite excited about. And uh, 
we also shows that uh, um, there are okay. So this is essentially for classification. You can also use it for uh, computational chemistry. Uh, and finally, we show that you can use it for so-called diffractive neural network, which are these are technical terms. So I'll I'll let you uh, learn about it. And that's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Quang. Uh, are there any questions? Any questions, including question about what are the bad things about KK? Uh, Justin? Well, uh, yeah. So, sorry, I, I'm not going to go that far and ask that kind of question. But <laughs> you, know, you had a very interesting slide, um, and you just kind of whizzed past it. Um, and you had this um, uh, Hartree-Fock calculation using a quantum computer. So is there, is there actually an advantage to using no. uh, a quantum computer? So there's no advantage? The quick answer is no so, at the moment. So, so, is, so, so what's the plan now to, to achieve any kind of a, a advantage? Because the thing is, hardship calculations aren't, aren't very easy to do, right? But the As same question was also asked many, many years ago, many moons ago, uh, for classical computing. So people ask, is there any advantage in uh, using a computer to handle salary payment? when I could do it on my file system. Actually, at that time, it was a no answer as well. But as the number of staff increases, then it becomes uh, rapidly obvious that uh, a computer or some me mechanical machine is always better. But at the moment, we still need to surface the, overcome the physics, the physics of noise. I see. So, yeah. so maybe I ask you a slightly different question then. Okay. So, um, how? Oh, what's the cusp? What's the critical number that we need to um, bypass? A few thousand. A few thousand of qubits or, qubits. or of qubits. Yeah. Of qubits, and uh, once you have a few thousand good qubits, you can assemble them for fault tolerance quantum computing. Yeah, because uh, uh, a logical qubit can be made out of um, fifty of these qubits. The minimum is 17. Yeah. Yes, yes, Spinaki. Yes, we could. We could play around with it. Okay. At the moment, the, uh, the, the rates are not fantastic. The error rates are, are high. And so um, you might say, oh, maybe I'm not simulating uh, perfect, but I'm simulating some effective master equation. That's fine. And, and uh, can I ask yeah, yeah. one more? Well, you said analog compu uh, simulation is still uh, over the horizon. Yes. But there are reports of analog simulation which in fact is much more active than digital simulation. Because yes, you that's need simulators. Eh? We are talking uh, about simulators in some sense. Analog mm, computers are more or less simulators. Mm, well, well, it's very or, hard to classify, but yeah, there's a gray shade. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, analog quantum simulation on a quantum computer. Ah, okay. the, that is, as you said, that yeah. arrange the On a digital quantum computer. On a digital quantum computer. Okay. Like this time crystal thing and Oh, other. yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. So they are already here, right? They are here, but uh, if you don't mind the, for very few qubits. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Very, very few. Actually, beyond five is terrible at the moment. So we still want to lower the noise. Mm -hmm. uh, the hope is with ion trap, because ion oh, trap can lower the noise. We now, in Singapore, we now have access to ion Q, uh, by the way. And so you can actually ask people at CQT if you can apply for testing. Uh, How many qubits? Uh, they have um, 20 qubits. That's a lot. But the queuing time is 3,000 hours. <laughs> Apparently, yeah. The queuing time is the one that kills you. But like any supercomputer, is always the queuing time. Except that this computer is uh, available worldwide, right? So mm -hmm. there are a lot more players. Okay. 
but they don't give you dedicated access. <laughs> okay. Chan wants to ask. Yeah. Yeah, um, so yeah, thanks for the talk. I want to ask you about the slides when you mentioned that um, beam splitter can act as a qubit. Sorry? Beam splitters can uh -huh. act as a qubit. So this is the first time I learned about this. So, so my question No, essentially, is, it breaks it up into alpha 0 plus beta 1. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, so my question is, you mentioned that the problem with photon is that it's, um, it is, it's, they don't interact. Um, yes. But what about um, fermions or even anions? Because anions colliders are a thing people already did. You mean uh, using, using anions, anions to do... Yeah. Anion those, beam those are not photonic. Those are solid state. So is it possible to use them for as a qubit? Or? At the moment, Microsoft is the only company that is hopeful about it, except that the current recession in the United States has asked them to fall back. But they, they were very keen on that. So the only problem with that is it operates at low temperature, is that right? When you say it, it could operate at near room temperatures, okay. but with uh, but is, even then it is cryo cryogenic, four yeah. degree, yeah. four Kelvin is a privilege. Okay, it's, it's very very warm. Oh, I, I, I was wondering if there's any uh, fundamental reason why fermionics or anionics or why photonics beam splitters are better. It, it, they mimic the electrons. So why don't we just use electrons? Uh, they are noisy. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Back to the same question. Yeah. But yeah, the current ones are noisy as well. And anion colliders are already a thing, but I no, guess because in the long term we want to replace the electronics with uh, with this these carriers, right? In some yeah. sense. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Okay, I think we better move yeah. on. Can yeah. we thank, thank uh, Prof. Quirk again?